Hi there and welcome to Soundpaint. Welcome to Adastra Solar Strings. You may know that the Adastra string collection in Soundpaint is made from three different libraries. We began the journey with our Adastra full ensemble strings, super lush, very sort of filmic strings. Then the second volume is our chamber or divisa strings. That would be smaller sections of the string groups, violins, cellos, basses and violas, but more intimate sounding. But in this video here, we're going to go even more narrow in the world of ensembles down to solo instruments. The Adastra solo strings are made from a beautiful, very expressive solo violin, a very emotive cello and viola, and a beautiful double bass as well. We can play them individually, we can play them together as ensembles as well. But I thought it could be cool to do this in a little bit of an unusual way. You see, when we were building the alpha version of the library, I sent it to Natalie Tenenbaum, a good friend of mine and an amazing orchestrator, and sort of proposed to Natalie like, hey, would you like to try to write a demo with this library here? And there's no like guidelines or anything I want in particular. I really just want you to use the library in the way you want. If you want to modulate the strings inside of sound paint, you can do that. If you want to play them in their natural state, you can do that. If you want to mangle them into something we've never heard before, morph them with other instruments, you can do that. No limits at all. And Natalie came back with a masterful demo, which we're about to listen to, where she really took this library and played it both naturally, but also used it in ways I've never seen before. For example, she took the solo violin spiccato and ran it through the arpeggiator, which really led to magical results and sort of inspired a whole sort of movement in this demo here, a very elaborate demo. So without further ado, I can't wait to watch this with you as well. Uh, Natalie and I recorded this a couple of weeks ago and it was just a magical session, really sitting and talking about the process of orchestration. Natalie has orchestrated Lang Lang's latest album and is one of the leading orchestrators on Broadway as well really knows her way around this beautiful world of samples and it's just been an incredibly humbling venture for me because she's so much more gifted in all these things than I am and for me to be the purveyor of instruments and offer it to someone so skilled and to see her taken away in such magical ways just maybe the greatest joy of what I do.
So just um, there might be people out in the world that don't know your background. Mm -hmm. And for me, what I just heard was somewhere between Rachmaninoff and Thomas Newman. Oh, wow. And it's clear that you're a pianist by heart as well and an orchestrator. But I just wonder if like you could tell just a little bit about your backstory just for people so they have an idea about your background. Sure. This it's always a... tricky to answer that. I feel like people ask me that and I never know because I do so many different things. So it's like, oh, which which part of the story do I yeah, yeah. start with or end with? But um, yeah, my background is definitely in classical music primarily. I came to New York uh, to study classical music at Juilliard um, a million and one years ago, <laughs> uh, where I studied, my main focus was piano performance, obviously. It's my main thing, which I still do, um, perform on piano. But um, yeah, I also studied composition uh, with Tanya Leon, if you're familiar, uh, separately from that and, and some conducting, but that's sort of my main sort of background. And then after that, I, I started working um, not just as a performer, but also as an arranger and orchestrator. Uh, and I've worked with uh, various sort of artists and orchestras and whatnot. Um, so that's sort of it in a nutshell. And um, yeah, I just feel like it's still what will be really cool with regards to, to sampling in this library is really showing me. I want to learn, actually, you know, since we're here. Um, what I love to do when I write music is start with the piano just because it's so natural for me and that's what my background is and just kind of like sketch things out and, and compose and have an idea of what I want, you know, the orchestra or ensemble to sound like around it. When once you have, obviously the main, for me at least in my process, is to have sort of like the overall structure, this is almost five minutes, just kind of like feeling out like what the music should feel like, you know, harmonically, melodically what it should do, but then I would love to take a deep dive with you into, you know, not just orchestration, but just really like painting with the sounds that are at our disposal here and like fixing, when, you know, not necessarily fixing, but just sort of addressing certain things and how you can go from like maybe like a muddy moment to like a clearer thing that, that could showcase the vision of what as a composer one yeah. might have, you know? You know, we were talking a little bit earlier like about the difference between composers, orchestrators and producers. Mm -hmm. And I certainly more fall in the latter of that category, right. where I think you belong in all three, probably. Um, but it's an interesting exercise for me because I I don't have anything to add on an orchestration level. I think it's a beautiful composition and your um, chord based and melodic vocabulary is more advanced than mine, though I can right. appreciate and un understand it. Um, but where, I, where the production part comes in can sometimes be helpful in terms of augmenting certain things and all that. So. So that, that might be where I can be of some some level of help. Like when you wrote this piece, was that just one consecutive flow like of, of piano? Like you didn't do any orchestration? Was it like all five minutes written on piano Interest first? It's interesting you ask that. I mean, it's, it's funny you say that because I used the beautiful 1985 C5 piano, hmm. soft felt. And I just sort of like improved the whole thing from top to finish. And I was like, I'll repeat it. I'll fix it later. Like, okay. cause there was definitely moments here I can play with just solo the piano. Like it's far from perfect. And even though it is on the grid and there's like meter changes here and whatnot, like it was just the way it was played. And I was like, I'll come in and play it more accurately later. And I never did. I cut the beginning cause I wanted it to be more strings and I replaced it with strings and added like a couple things that we'll get into with the strings, but sort of just did it as like a one. I knew sort of like what I was, you know, I wanted it to do a certain corp, corp progression in the B section, if you want to call it that. And it's like ABA sort of. So I just kind of like thought about like, okay, start here, end here, do something cool in the middle and just sort of played it out. And then it was like, okay, now let's take out the brushes and try to like do some cool stuff around it, which we'll improve on now. But that was sort of the process. So first the sketch uh, in free form, like it's an improvisation. Like just yeah, I mean, yeah. As I mean, I can play you. You can see it's nothing is quantized. It's kind of a hot mess actually, but maybe there's something cool to that. Like uh, I cannot reiterate enough how important it is to be off the grid. Like yeah. imagine you have a band. We talked about big bands earlier today, an orchestra that were on the grid. They right. would lose everything. And I, I think sometimes the grid-based music though is great for certain applications, dance, dubs, right. all that trap. Let's take a rock band, for example. If the drummer gets excited, he might increase his tempo slightly, even if he's tight. Right. And as well, he plays gives louder, the music that's life. part of the expression. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But if you're on the grid, like imagine my conversation here right now running, like it would, <laughs> it would all be, the grid is bad for music. 
for, for most, yeah. for, especially for this style style of music, you do not want to be on the grid. Yeah, no, I agree. I mean, I had sort of like, I had the click, because I knew I wanted to ultimately match what I was going to build on top of for this composition. I mean, I just had the click going on like, want, like just no, you know, specific meter. And I just played knowing that I'm going to go in and then change the meter after right. the fact. It's, kind of, it's backwards. It's probably not the way that... No, I, no it's, you know, I, know, it's I, know, it? I I think it's forwards. Like, yeah. If music is a reflection of life, which Herb Hancock says, like, then do you want your life on a grid, or would right. you like want your life as a fluent thing? I, I, you know, and even down to like creating instruments, I, I think about the same. The second our instruments sort of start getting math-like, they start losing, losing their soul the as well. Yeah, right. it, it, like imperfection. It's a, it's a perfect amount of imperfection. Right, 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 right. Cool. So should we just start in the beginning and just kind of go like phrase by phrase, or sure. So in the beginning here, let me just solo this for a second. I just feel like this is such a cool um, program. This is the um, Adastra Solo Violin Main Spiccato, but what's, what was really cool to me about this was the ARP function, which I was kind of skeptical originally. I was like, what is that going to sound like? Obviously we're going for somewhat of a realistic sound and it's like a built, you know, it's like a synthesized kind of like ARP thing on a string. But when I heard it, I was like, oh, I have to keep this. This is cool. Here, let me just solo it by itself. I was surprised too. Yeah, and you'll tell me what you think about the reverb on this, but... Like, it's like not clean. But it's cool. <laughs> like, it could have been plain. <laughs> yeah, that, it gets a little bit synthesized once. Right, once it went too many at once. Like, you yeah. would have taken a break. Yeah. Right. So we can talk a little bit about that if you want. Yeah, yeah, let me pause that, right? So why is that working um I, I for me there's like two reasons it's working like the, the first and foremost reason is that the performer was really invested into the short notes which is normally pretty hard to do in sample sessions because they tend to be somewhat mathematical which is right. a problem in sampling mm -hmm. and the other part is that their samples is more technically but their samples so extensively that you get enough variations every time so it's not the same note repeating itself right so you got round robin velocities and you sound paint because you have infinite amount of them, you get even more variations of that. And then depending on what you play, will sound more or less real. Obviously, no real player would be that precise. You can right. also massage the ARP. There's an analog function right. in it. I think I actually did that. Let's open it and see. Oh, oh no, not in this one. I did it in another one. Let's try it. Should we try it? To... You, you can try to... It, it's just kind of like increase the percentage a little bit. Yeah. How much would you... I mean, just... Not a lot. Just give it like just 7, like 9%, one. something like that. Let's, yeah, pause it here. You're at 8%. The dynamic units are like programmed to go. Oh, okay. Oh, so you have it. Yeah. yeah. So I had it going like this. Pretty much the same. Maybe gave it a little bit extra. A little Let's bit. Let's see. Yeah. 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 The swing is like 10%. Oh, you yeah, got swing on it too? Yeah. Oh, okay. You already massaging I the arm. I did a little bit, but I feel like the analog we just added kind of increased the... Like it just added like more of a vibe to it, I feel. Yeah, yeah, yep. Yeah. So it's. I think it's often a dance between like you need to have the same balls done the right way with the right emotion and then mm -hmm. you need the technologies to facilitate that amount of expression as well. What are your thoughts on like the processing as far as like the effects that I have on... that I had on it? I mean, I have the, the stereo image here. I think that was like the way that the that the program was made, so that that's untouched. But I put a little bit more of like the Lexi reverb. I think it's great. I love it. I some love some delay, like the BBD delay, and then like a little bit of compression, cool. the EQ and everything. Like that patch, we're good with. You know, I love that you're telling me because I'm not looking at right now that you're explaining to me. I had no idea there was a delay in there as well. I didn't. I didn't hear that. I just think it sounded it sounded big. Did you? It's bold to take a solo violin and make it that big. I love it. <laughs> I, I wouldn't... Leaned in. Listen, it's a, it's a string demo. Listen. One thing I'm curious about, um, when you move the mod wheel when you're playing the ARP, does the mod wheel do something right now? This is just an old school approach that the mod wheel should always be doing something. Right. So if you wanted to have it more expressive, you could like apply either a little bit of filter to it or a little oh. bit of EQ to it or a little bit of volume or all three. So what I would do is that I would open EQ5. I would take the top band in the highs and then find the place where you think this sounds like the violin playing softly because mm. you can you can dim the sound with the eq you can make it more muffled and then yes. then we'll go in the opposite direction okay so you can see it's already set here mm. 
but I would expand it a little bit further. So like normally like find the range here and you can you can move the mod wheel as you do this right now as you play. So mm. if, if you try to play and move the mod wheel. Ah. You see? Yeah. And, and you can do it to multiple bands as well. So it might be that you down here. So you can assign oh, it wow. to, and okay. you can also assign it to the band here. So it can also go this way here at the same time when you move the mod wheel. So depending on how deep you want to go, I normally, I'm pretty lazy. So I'll normally just do it to one or two bands, mm. but this allow this gives you more expression on the sound, if that oh, makes wow. sense. Yeah. Yeah, that's radically different. <laughs> Because I feel like traditionally what, what you would do is massage the CCs by like drawing in every single function. Yeah. For hours. Yeah. Days. For hours. Yeah. Weeks, yeah. Months. Years. Yes. <laughs> Decades. No, and, and you know, it's a really, really important point actually. Because yeah. for people that do mock-ups for a living, they know that they know the pain of living on the CC grid. And right. it is the most unrewarding part of the compositional process for sure. Right. And especially with older technologies, because there is no ways of getting around it. Now right. at least we can start, like we can get it on the keys where, mm -hmm. it, where it belongs. You can be the conductor just by moving the mod wheel, like you're closer to the composition. But just sitting with a mouse and drawing curve, curves, for me at least, is not musically rewarding in any way. It takes right. me out of the creative process. Also, it's it's different, like if you're going and automating like volume or whatnot versus the EQ just immediately yeah. changes the tone. Yeah. And you can just control it with one yeah, yeah. while you're playing. If it's this. It, it's a very difficult thing in our world to translate a fretless wooden instrument that's three, four hundred years old down to a modern keyboard where it doesn't belong. Right. And and get the expression in there as well. How do you how do you capture that the essence of that instrument in this form? That's what I think the sort of new way of thinking of using the technology. Like I can get closer to the instrument now because I can do more of the stuff on the keys, but I'm no longer have to sit and do it over here in the doll where I'm unrelated to the musical process. Right. So I think it's so important that we, we try to keep it on the keys, get the UI out of there, get the doll out of the way. You're just right, right. there in the music. Yeah. Instead of just drawing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Especially for you. I mean, for you as a performer, it must be extra punishing because like, yeah, you just want to play. Right. Because it's also like you're drawing and you're drawing and you're drawing and then you play it back and you're like, oh, yeah, it's <laughs> yep. two hours later. <laughs> There's something in the visual world like, um, like a Y, S, I, G, whatever. What you see is what you get. Right. And I always wanted the same for some pain. Like what I hear is what I get. Yeah, no, so like not, immediate gratification. Yes. Like so you can move on to the next here. Like, yeah. So if you imagine like that all your patches are built around that concept that yeah. you can control it on here and get off the grid, mm -hmm. it, you can you can get through all these expressive like places faster. Oh yeah. So particularly for an instrument like this, which is up in the higher range, you can hear there's air mm -hmm. from the rust and from the bow. The yeah. EQ would be extra expressive up there if you take one of the highs. What I would do in your case is that I would uh, normally I, I will create a loop and I'll cycle that same part okay. and then I'll sit with the I'll just move the EQ until I find like the place of the high air. Real it's tight. all about the range. How how bright do you want it? Where do you want it? How low do you want it on the lows? Sounds different. 
I kind of like it just lower in general. I feel like okay. maybe I can set the high to be lower. But yeah, that's cool. That sounds better already, I think. And if you ever want something like super soft to be mm -hmm. super loud, you put a compressor in the end and just crank the gain on it, which I often do on very soft sounds, but to make sure they can match even something epic, mm. just throw a compressor at the end of your effects chain. Oh, interesting. And then just hit the gain on it. That way you can, it can be as soft as possible, but it can, it can match a full orchestra as well. So, right. And you can kind of automate it such that, you know, if you're on one track and the beginning of the piece is quiet yeah. and then you want it to obviously build momentum, you can just like automated for later to yeah, kind yeah. of increase the, the compression on that same volume yep. of, a, of a program. Exactly. That's awesome. Obviously after the mix and everything, but like you could kind of hear like, I don't know, for me, I love that sound of like the stretched, it's not cool. perfect, you know, non Juilliard sitting there playing it perfectly. Like. Non Juilliard, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Forgive me, this was a super long departure down one out of a gazillion rabbit holes we can go down. Yeah. I'm super curious about just the first part of the composition. You're doing some beautiful sustained strings. There's some mm -hmm. Sodino or something that I, I couldn't figure out. It was just yeah. so pretty. Like the first like minute. Pink here, I'll just play that by itself. Because I love actually your feedback on this exact moment. I just sort of layered a few programs as they were right out of the box. Um, I did a couple of, so yeah, the solo violin marcato. I have a couple of those, the sustained solo violin. And then I added tremolo patch that you created in the ensemble. Oh, okay. Oh, that, uh, okay. That's yeah. what And then brings... the ET legato patch. So I sort of oh, layered wow. all of these together. Wow. But I love your input on like, you know, what you think. Cause I, I'm a fan of layering and obviously there's, it's limitless nowadays when you have these computers, the M2 chip, thank you, Apple. <laughs> but um, yeah, I just love to hear your thoughts. I'm like, do you think this is like sort of like overkill? Like how would you, well, what are your thoughts on combining the different libraries here? Here, I'll just play it by itself. So well, this is without the piano. So that's just a very specific. This is another sort of general question, but like when you're putting on like Lexi Reverb, for example, in the engine, like is there sort of like a range you operate within? Like obviously it depends on the sound, it depends on the context, the piece, the instrument, a million things, but like in a moment like this, are you like, you know, cause I have it at 25% right now. Is that, would you say that's aggressive? <laughs> What's your sort of take on that? Like oh, man. how you, you know, since. Yeah, yeah. So I've always been on the, I've always baptized my stuff a little too much. And when I listened back to my old stuff, I was oh, like, wow. Baptized. I like yeah, that. Yeah. Just don't yeah, get I, into the reverb. Totally. <laughs> too much. I love yeah. reverb so much. Yeah. Like Valhalla and all of them. Yeah. Um, no, I'm, I'm an addict. It's a problem. I need to rehab. Right, right. No, the same for me. So, yeah. but I think over time, a really good mix is always clear. Right. Like that's, that's what makes the, uh, like, especially like when it comes to like modern epic and all that, like the, the normally like the, the water sort of split between someone who's good and someone who's like super high end, like in terms of how clean their productions come mm. out. So you, you can push the bar with reverb and distortions and all that stuff, but how do you do it and, and you put in a clean way at the same time? Right. So reverb is not good for that because it tends to, it tends to muddy it, but it, it's also so beautiful at the same time. So for me, 25% to answer your question it's is too much. Is, I, too I'll good. normally try to stay like, like six to, 11 12 percent something like that got it uh, but it also depends on how long the tail is and one more thing in sound paint as well like the, i uh you there's can a automate that obviously you can automate it yeah. um but i like to take the tone knob let's take the lexa reverb and then move it slightly to the right which oh, will kill some of the some of the depths of the reverb and only highlight some of the higher frequencies that way it doesn't get as muddy in the bases oh what you're saying yeah, this is really cool because I deliberately with these sketches, you know, tried to stay um, only sound paint, everything like no third party, anything minus the reverb that we heard in the beginning. But now that we're sort of getting into it and obviously I added reverb, which we're moving now, but here we go. So this is what it sounds like without it or with just the very little of it. Here, this one still this has... sounds pretty wet. Yeah, this one still had some. Okay. Let me cut that out. It's also like, you know, the microphones can sometimes also help with that. 
when you use like uh, more uh, ambient microphones, mm. they, they take care of a lot of the reverb stuff as well. Interesting. Here, let's try it again. Tell me if this sounds better. Two bars before. Sounds much better without the reverb, to be honest. <laughs> so I, I, yeah, I actually cleaner. liked it the other way. I actually liked it more when it was just washed in reverb. Oh, really? Yeah. Because I thought that was like. If I found like more, it more clear, like this. You don't. You feel like it needed the reverb I or some of it. Maybe like a happy medium. It's definitely a cleaner mix, mm -hmm. removing it. But I felt um, a little bit of a harsh nature in it. So what I probably would do was like I would probably try to retain the clarity, but come down a little bit in the harshness, and that could be using EQ. And the EQ we, per track, which we'll do. Yeah, yeah. I'll do that. Uh, yeah. It, yeah, I have to. But but it, but it, but it can be. It's. The EQ, EQ can help tell all those stories. It can retain the clarity, but you can still sort of emulate the muffleness or the shine using it, you know? So you right. can use it for the, for expression. Um, cool. But you definitely got more clarity now, so so you're more pr you're more present with oh, the yeah. instruments. No, that sounds really... They sound so good even without the reverb. But just adding like a little bit of it in, I feel like, back to what, what it was, but not fully. Thank you for being so open-minded and open-eared, by the way. I mean, I, I really, there is no right or wrong. This is just my ear, you know? Yeah, no, it's I'm so just... so beautiful the way it is, like... I'm just loving all the different, like, you know, textures that can be created that I probably wouldn't have, you know? It's just, and it's so easy to do it with sound band. It's like... It really is, yeah, yeah. Yeah, just one, two, three, and... For everything you do up here, you're one step further away from making music. Yeah. No, exactly. Yeah, and if you have to create, like, hours of music per you know, any given time frame, like you don't, you can't just sit and sketch. No, no. And for me, like, I don't, <laughs> I'm, I'm, let me ask you something. When you're in your process, how long, let's say there's any kind of distraction, how many seconds can a distraction pull you out of where you are? Can it be five seconds, 10, 20? Yeah. I mean, it, it, it depends. It really depends. It could be anything, but what's, it gets frustrating when you're thinking of a certain, you know, you have like an idea. It's almost like when you wake up in the morning and you had a dream, and you're trying to remember what it was. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. You know, or like you're yeah. thinking of something, you're like, oh, you hear a certain progression in your mind, and you kind of like take a second, you figure it out, but then you don't, you know, from recording, unless you really just get it out, you know, and it's cool to be able to get it out with the instrumentation as close to what it ultimately will be without having to like sit and draw for hours. <laughs> so that's why I'm happy to kind of like learn these tools, especially when it's, you know, you, you hear it in your mind, like you want something filtered a certain way and EQ'd a certain way. And there's a, but like, if you're going to try to do it externally to whatever engine or however you're working, like it's each thing takes yeah. so long to really dial in the yeah. way that you want to. Yep. So that's why it's like to really become a master of this. It's like, you really don't need all those other things. So you can just generate so much more music so yeah. much faster. I would love to hear more about like your thoughts as a composer as well. How do you orchestrate this? Like, how did you come up with those beautiful chords? Well, the chords, I feel like it's just the piano. Like, I mean, I keep going back to this, but since this, this 1928 piano is really something. I'm going to just sit and play. And then it's just, I don't know, like the piano is first for me. And I just kind of sit and play chords. And that only starts with piano for me. And having this amazing um, Steinway, like right there is just I didn't have any preconceived, like I opened the door and I was just like, okay, what are we playing today? I opened this piano and then later the felt 1965, like I had the idea on the main. On... I just love those two, I don't know. I don't know, I sat and I just like started playing. That's how it started. I just kind of like got got into these chords. Started improvising with that and then pulled up the... Once I knew that that was the beginning and the end, like the A section, 
Oh, that was structure. Then I just kind of like knew I was going to do that. And then in the begin in the middle, I knew I wanted like a more moving uh, section with, with the pits, which maybe we can like talk about that next. For someone like you that can both read notation and know all the chords in the world and all that stuff, like when you play like this, are you thinking about like certain chord progressions or even the name of the chords or are you, are you free from all that? That's interesting. I feel like it's a combination, you know, because I feel like when you've sort of studied certain pieces and are familiar with certain progressions or whatnot, like, you know, your ear sort of gravitates towards certain things. But like I said, I mean, what's cool is to get into the moment and the different, if, if I'm sitting at the piano in one place versus another, one instrument versus another, like a different kind of chord will come out. I feel like if, if it was like a different sound, if I had pulled a synth or something else, I probably would have played a different progression. Right, right. But um, as far as thinking about the overarching, the whole composition, I don't really, sometimes I do, it depends on what it is. Like sometimes, I mean, with songwriting or if, depending on the medium or whatever. Yeah. Whatever the composition is gonna ultimately be, but when it's just like free form or first sitting down i never really think that far got it. i just kind of like get inspired and play whatever comes out got it. do you want to check out some of the pits yes uh, i love moments? that i love that part of it because i feel like with that um speaking again going back to like you know sort of like a realism conversation versus just creatively going wherever and morphing sounds and kind of synthesizing things i did add here i'm just going to solo this solo cello Pitts moment without reverb first. Let's see. Oh yeah, I have 41% reverb on this. Let's tone that down for a second. But I feel like it's, I don't know. I know, I, I, don't th know. I thought it was a vibe. It's, I th it's I like a bath. Like you, you chose to make a wet piece and that's okay. Yeah, it's kind of like drowning in the ocean, but here we go. <laughs> What's wrong with that? It's drier, obviously, but. Late there, but so cool. that's cool with the delay, right? So cool. Context. I love the delay on it. You know. I love everything about it. Yeah, I actually, actually like it drier without the reverb because you can hear the delay detail more and also just like the the richness of the sample of the just like the pits, the, the way that the solo Adastra cello was sampled is amazing. I love that part. Is the pizzicato coming from the cello? Yeah. Okay. Even yeah, the there's bass. two. There's there's that layer and then there's another pits here, which is actually an arped. Oh, it's just quiet. Oh. Yeah, that's a lot of reverb again, but. Here, this is with that reverb. Sounds better without the reverb, to be honest. Almost like a banjo. It does. I thought that. Yeah. Because I did, I mean, I don't know what inspired me to do that, but I did put an ARP on this particular moment. Um, it goes up and down two octaves. Oh, you got the scatter delay on it. Yeah. So with no reverb. I didn't get the shuffle when I heard it. I kind of got a button swing to it. One trick with reverb as well, um, from one reverb lover to another, um, is that I like to have long tails like you do, mm -hmm. but I just set the mix really like not that like that's why I keep the mix down. Mm. So you can, but if you make the tails shorter, I generally don't. This is just my own preference. I don't like short tails so much for reverbs. I like to keep it up. Right. I just get the mix down because that way I get the clarity, but I still get a little bit of the the decay kind of. 
yeah, have to add that um, that etherealness of reverbs in there. The space, yeah. And then, of course, there's good old panning as well. Forgive me for interrupting, right. but you know, panning the instruments can also help bring that space in it, like particularly with orchestral stuff. Yeah, which I did like a little bit, okay. but it's like you kind of want to emulate, you know, like violins, you'll pan them here, cello, just open them just a little bit yep. so it feels like you're hearing it yep. in the hall. What are your thoughts here on this section? Because I went a little aggressive. <laughs> the solo, the solo mercado. Here we go. Right. So that one obviously needs the EQing, but like this is stylistic choice, and I love it. Like particularly when the solo band kicks in, that totally works for me because he's so dramatic in the first yeah, note, and the Mikados are supplementing it. I would, I would personally build up the Mikados. Mm. You can either do that just by going and taking your velocity layers and just drawing over them, going like tick 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 tick. It, um, Let's do that. Let's, let's see how let's... that works first. I've, Here, let me I'm... just solo that real quick. This is wait, what program is this? This is actually the the solo bass main um, spiccato program. Great. Yeah, that's so yeah. Nice. Rock and roll. <laughs> it's funny that it's a bass program, but I'm like sort of playing mid range. Oh, know I love what, that. What called for that? But that's what also is cool about sampling is that you don't have to play them sort of like traditionally in the like sort of limited range where the instrument would live. You can do violins in the bass and right. Yeah, that's Vi violins stretch, playing bass you know, is like the is one like note the thing. nicest thing. Like yeah. they're so warm and because the, the string is so tight, you still get a very precise bass sound. Whereas basses tend to be a little more more muddy in their pitch. Right. Like, 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 like this sounds super intense and I feel like if I were to just do it on a violin patch, it would maybe sound a little meeker, but because yeah. it's bass, even though it's sort of more centered, yeah. I feel like it kind of cuts, cuts across. But like, what are your thoughts here? Because there's still some reverb on it, by the way, which I could kill, but... So there, there, um, there are many, like, <clears throat> let's, let's just say stylistically that you want it to more like sort of slowly dial in before you really hit it. So da, 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 right. bang. So there's a couple of ways you can do that. Mm. Um, you can use EQ, EQ. like we showed mm -hmm. before. Um, you can use offset as well. Offset, interesting. If you go into rack okay. and Just choose rack offset, a. and then uh, you will assign the um, detail of the offset, of the offset to, to some kind of modulation control. source Wait, on the keyboard. This one. Yeah, and then mm -hmm. limit the range so it's Small. only like the first like 30, 40% of it. Starting at like zero, right? Yeah. Okay. Even in the low velocities, I still feel it's a little bit like, you know? Yeah. You want to build up to that rather than starting there. Yeah, that, that's what I'm saying. In this, in your sequencer, I would just take the velocity so they go like, that's, that should work. Mm -hmm. But the other way to get around it is to go in here and take this detail guy here and then set it here because it will, it will cut off that initial part of the bow stroke. Oh. So a little bit like we did before. Oh, wow. It, but it can be a little bit synthesized as well. So I'm not I'm not crazy about it. Just a little. Just a, yeah. I, like to taste. Yeah, it's probably much less than it had. Like, so it's all, we're all the way down here. So starting at, starting here, then yeah. going down. But then I'll also, let's see here. I would also go Mm. I would try wow, to figure that, out. That is, that just blew my mind today. So it could be help. You can do it that way. Mm -hmm. You could add a filter, a tiny amount of filter as well. Oh, no resonance. Mm. That can help create the same effects. You can also say, hey, I don't want to have it on any controller. Mm -hmm. I actually want to be able to control it as I play on the keyboard. You can right click, say MIDI CC automation and say velocity note response. Mm. Now the filter is going to trigger based on your velocity when you play. That That's another way of doing it as well. You know, it's so funny. I've been using SoundPaint now for a while and I wasn't even 
didn't even occur to me to use that function. That's what's so cool about it. It's like, yeah, but that's also what's challenging for me because like I take it for granted and that's my mistake because you're a power user and you're like, yeah, like I've been using it since beta and I, oh, I yeah. never would have even. Right. So yeah, so, no, that's like, that's so cool. That's not just like this, like stagnant, sterile. Okay. That's a sample. Good luck. Here's no. a pencil drawing some CC. <laughs> Good luck. Yeah. You know, it's like, oh, you could actually like, not even just for realism purposes, but just for just your own creativity and getting your music out, like yep. coloring, like these chords that you're hearing. Okay. could actually sound good yeah. as opposed to like, oh, I guess I'm, I don't have access to strings for this one demo too bad. Yeah. You know, I wanted to say that the way you started the composition just by doing a piano sketch is, is that that's the still the main body, all the other sound paints and ornaments we can, it, we talked about it earlier today. It's a, it's a tricky balance because it's so easy to fall in the rabbit hole of colors and more and more and more. Right. And yet, the the core composition just on the piano was enough as well. You know, it's it's yeah. such a. No, I I mean I agree. I definitely agree. I feel like it's at the core. I mean, a lot of the things I do is, I, I I'm just really this week not to plug my own music or anything, but <laughs> on August 18th, which we're here in August. Whenever you watch the video, but um, August 18th uh comes a record um we're releasing a record that i'm super proud of uh called duets slash solos and it's me and one of my good friends and, and collaborator Eitan uh kenner and it's literally we got into what used to be avatar is now power station uh studio the legendary uh studio a and we just sat in front of each other on two grand pianos and improvised and played the entire record oh my god yeah and it's literally just acoustic piano the whole record so great and i feel like acoustic piano and just playing that by itself is sort of so much of what i'm my whole sort of experience with music is that from a very young age to now and having this but particularly with the engine what we're talking about today is is just it's so exciting it just keeps for me and it may be sounding a little cliche or whatever but I don't care. That's just how it is. It just keeps the whole notion of like being a musician and creating music like fresh for me. Because mm -hmm. like you know, it is endless what you could do with the ADA keys and everything. Of course, and I'll continue to put out records, hopefully, please, for many years. You know, and it's that's my first love and what I came here to do initially to this country. And I'm so glad that like I'm able, for, privileged enough to do this for a living. But adding all these different, you know languages so to speak into the like the sound design thing is just incredible and this instrument is mind-blowing so cool i thank you equally thank you yeah. so much <laughs>